Today, this weekend is Memorial Weekend, and it's a weekend that we salute those who have served in the military in this nation. If that's you, I'd like you to stand up, please, just for a second. If you've served in the military, woo, let's go. Thank you for your service. Thank you. We honor you. We appreciate the sacrifice that you gave. We value that. So I want to talk a little bit about memorial, the memorial of the greatest champion that ever lived. Is that okay? Because if we're going to honor men, and we do genuinely honor those men and women that have sacrificed their life, especially the ones that didn't make it home, we honor that. If that's the level, the Bible talks about double honor. So if I'm going to give honor there, my honor for the kingdom has to be double that. Those that lead, then the one that leads, he gets quadruple honor, as far as I'm concerned. 10x on that. Okay? So, we know that Jesus, we've just had, you know, Passover, Jesus died, he was crucified on the cross, he laid his life down, it wasn't taken from him. Okay? We've gone over that the last few weeks. Jesus gave his life, it wasn't taken. No one could have killed him, he gave it as a willing sacrifice. So the courage that Jesus had to walk in is greater than anyone in this room. The minute he was born, it was for the purpose to be a sacrifice. Just like if you go into the, if you go into the uh, traditional Levitical practices, they didn't just get random sheep to be sacrificed annually for Passover. There was a special herd that was growing for that sacrifice. There were special olive trees that were growing right next to, or in Gethsemane actually, for the crushing of those olives to be the oil that was used in the temple. So everything had meaning. When Jesus was born and he was called the Lamb of God, he was born for that purpose. And essentially, I just want to maybe appeal to a slightly different side because as you've heard me talk about before, most people in the modern church, they see Jesus as a very passive, pacifist Uh, gentle lamb. But I actually want to talk to you about the lion side of Jesus for a little bit today because Jesus coming to earth was not coming to be some, you know, theater-style guru that would offer some beautiful quotes that people could turn into memes on parchment paper. (laughs) Okay? Like, Jesus actually, the minute he was born, was a strategic assault on darkness. The minute he was born. The minute he was conceived, darkness was threatened. John chapter 1. Yeah? So that's why the devil got a hold of Herod and tried to kill two-year-old Jesus. Because although Jesus looked soft and cuddly at two years old, and he was probably amazingly soft and cuddly. The most amazing two-year-old that you've ever seen. His very presence was aggressive in nature. Jesus actually came as a military offensive on hell. For you, for me. We are, or we were, prisoners of war. Catching that? The prisoners of war, when Adam gave up his dominion and the serpent and Eve, and the serpent, the devil, took the keys, the keys were to the jailhouse now. And so Jesus had to uh, parachute in behind enemy lines in order to pull back the prisoner. That's why he came out quoting Isaiah saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news. To the poor. Poor who? Poor people in prison. To break chains and to open prison doors. Jesus was here for a military offensive 
And while the devil thought he looked like a lamb, his true nature was a lion. See, the, the, the devil is actually a wolf walking around trying to look like a lamb. But Jesus was a lamb that actually was a lion. But the sacrifice is now over. See, a lamb didn't walk into hell. A lion did. You have to get this. The lamb skin came off at, at Calvary. Come on. And the lion stood up. So everything that he did was military in nature. So when we see this, I want us to see because I'm not trying to, and by the way, I'm not in any way trying to take away from any kind of military memorial to uh, fallen troops, to those that have given all, to those that have given their lives and put, you know, careers on hold that they could have been making good money to go and serve this nation. That has a phenomenal value to this house. The Bible says, no greater love has this than a man would lay down his life for his friend. And so we have to honor that. The reason, one of the reasons why America is in such a mess today is because we're being taught not to honor that. And we refuse to be a house of dishonor. We're going to be a house of honor. Not just for spiritual things, but for natural things also. Like it's honorable for a father to stay in his house and not go running and chasing other women and raising his children in stability. That's honorable. Same for, for a mother. But at the same time, I just feel very led to speak about this from, from the perspective of, of Jesus, the great mighty warrior of heaven. In James chapter 5, keep your place in, in Micah, but in James chapter 5 and verse 4, it's actually talking about rich people ripping off workers and not paying them. So it says, listen and hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The, the prior verse says, woe to you rich. Okay. The cries of those who harvested your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. Hello? See, well, I just want to talk to like sweet Jesus, sweet baby Jesus. No, baby Jesus gone. He outgrew the diapers. He outgrew the cross. So, it's not uncommon that we, don't, we talk about this. We do talk about this, but I just, I, I want to go after it for a minute. Because Jesus is the general of the army of heaven. Actually, let me rephrase that. Armies, plural. The Bible describes armies, multiple armies of heaven. It doesn't say singular, it says armies. Dude, heaven's a big deal. Just because you can't see it, don't underestimate it. So, so there, is, there is a ferocious... Did you guys ever see that movie Gladiator? Do you, I've just, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I just feel it coming on, so I'm going to go there right now. Do you remember um, Marcus Aurelius, who was um, Russell Crowe, right? He was, the, he was the leader of the armies of the north. He was the general of that army. But then Caesar, who was getting old, had this son who was Joaquin Phoenix, right? Jo Joaquin Phoenix? Joaquin? Stop hating my accent. <laughs> Feeling picked on right now. And so he is someone that was trying to be respected as a king, but he had never fought on the battlefield. Do you guys remember the movie? He, he, he got dressed up in the military array, but he didn't really, he wasn't that great at what he did because he'd actually never bled on a field. Hello. And, and so a lot of the times you'll get people that sit, and, and please hear what I'm saying, although we are, and a lot of political tension in this nation. I'm not trying to make a political dig, but you're going to get my point because it's a global problem. You'll get people that sit in government buildings and they will send military units into foreign nations to fight wars that they'd never even understood. And when there's casualties, they don't care. Hello. They don't eat, they've never even stepped on. Personally, 
I think there should be there should be laws. If you're going to do that, you better have had experience in the field. How dare you come up through the governmental network, social money raising network, and then get into a position where you have no understanding of the value of life and death, and then put other people's lives in harm's way. Done on my rant. Let's carry on. And so that guy, that, guy uh, that was playing the new Caesar, now he had all the accolades of this great, ferocious military leader, but he'd never bled on the field. Whereas the Russell Crowe actor, Marcus Aurelius, he actually had the grit of battle in him. Can I just tell you, Jesus is not a king that has not fought. Not only has he not sat on the battlefield and watched his troops fight, He's led the charge, and he went where he asked no angel to go. He went where he asked no man to go. He went into the bowels of hell, where it looked like he'd been defeated. And the thing I love strategically about God is that actually, if you really look at God through history, from the Garden of Eden all the way through to Gethsemane, even in this present moment, Have you ever seen those animals that there's this particular fish, I forget the name of the fish, but this particular fish will lay lay on the bottom of the floor, like in the sand of the sea sea floor, and it'll actually pretend like it's dead. And then like shrimp and different things will come and like, or other little fish will come and pick on it thinking that it's actually food. And right when those other fish are starting to feel like they're having a feast, the fish that's been laying still strikes. And you see, that's really what Jesus did. If you really look at it from a military point of view, it looked like Jesus lost his power in Gethsemane when they took him with the soldiers. Even though he said, I am here and everyone lays out falling like they're dead. It looked like Jesus lost his power in the Sanhedrin, which is the the Hebrew, the Jewish, the high priest's uh, quarters, where they had like a little court. It looked like he lost his power in Herod's court. It looked like he lost his power on the steps of of Pilate's palace. It looked like Jesus, because it said that he, he didn't even cry out. He didn't even try and defend himself. Pilate's like, hey, I'm trying to get you out of this mess, man. I can see you're not a bad dude. And Jesus is like, you don't have any power unless it's been given to you from above. What he's saying is, you're not really in control here. In a very diplomatic way. He's just laying perfectly still. And the devil's just rubbing his hands. We got him, boys. We got him. Pharisees rubbing their hands. We got him. Jesus laying perfectly still. See, He already struggled in Gethsemane. That's what the sweats of blood were all about. But make no mistake, he is the captain of the armies of heaven. He is the general of the armies of heaven. He's the Lord of hosts. He is not passive. Just because God's not moving, and guys, I'm telling you, in in the future of your lives, even in the next 10 years, you're going to hear people starting to say, where is your God? Well, let me tell you where he is. He's laying perfectly still, putting the devil in a headlock, and the devil don't even know it. You just have to know the track record of God. He has an amazing ability of looking like nothing's happening, but everything's happening. And so all of that was happening all the way up to the moment that Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In that moment, I believe the devil knew he was in trouble because he didn't see a regular man die. He literally saw a man who was perfectly in control that submitted his spirit into the hands of the Father at the point of death. Now watch this. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I don't talk about it a lot, but I love it. Let's go back to Micah. I'm going to land in a few minutes. This is going to be the shortest messages ever. We're getting up out of here, people. (laughs) How many padres? Better to sing. (laughs) Uh, 
right? In Micah chapter 7 and verse 8. Do not, yeah, Micah 7 verse 8. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. I might have got bad news at the doctor. Don't you dare rejoice over me. This, you might think that you've got something locked in. But I've got a job that no, I've got a God that knows how to lay perfectly still in the midst of a transition, in the midst of a miracle, in the midst of a transfer, in the midst of a battle. I have a God that knows what he's doing. My, God, my job isn't to question him and doubt and murmur and complain. My, God, my job is to trust him and to partner with him knowing that he is faithful and able to keep me because I've committed my life to him and he's good for the job. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. Someone say that with me. When I fall, I will arise. It might look like I've taken a tumble. It might look like I got some bad news, but I'm getting up. You see, our God is a fighting king. He is a warrior king. He is not passive. You have not been left alone with your troubles and your problems and your sicknesses and your personal issues and your mental health. You have not been left alone. What the devil wants to do is make you feel like you're isolated so that you're now a victim. You are not a victim. You're a child of God. And you've got to get this. That's what this whole victim thing is. The whole victim culture that's out there, the cancel culture that's out there, what it's trying to do is disconnect people from trusting a God who might not be moving in the minute, but he's about to move at the hour. Come on. We've got to get back to a place where we trust God because there's a conditioning happening in the world right now that we knee-jerk to bad news. We need to learn to be a bit more stable. Do you know how people lose their finances in the stock market and crypto? It's been happening in the last few weeks. And if you have any knowledge of the crypto world, okay, what happens is the guys with all the money, they shake the market so that prices drop and everyone that doesn't really know what they're doing, but they're partially casually invested, freak out and emotionally give up their stake in the claim. They sell their coins for cheap. They sell their investment for cheap because a little shaking happened and they don't understand that there is a long-term plan. We've got to get this. We have to get this concept that God is in a long-term game with us, and if we assess our success or failure, our security or instability through moments where it looks like things are turning upside down, we miss the long-term plan of God. Memorial Weekend. Jesus, we honor you, great Son of God, who fell for a moment. Everyone ran. Peter went back to his fishing because the guy he'd been watching raised the dead and healed the lepers for three and a half years, died on a cross. See how fickle we are? Not just Peter. It's easy to go, oh, it's Peter. Peter ran away. <laughs> how many times have we run away? How many times have we freaked out? Where's God now? What's he going to do for me now? What's it, how's it all going to, how am I going to live? It's easy to look at Peter, but we do it. We're all, every single person, me too, we're all guilty in this room. Okay, but we need to shift. We need to become more stable and steadfast because we have a king that has a track record of never, ever tapping out. Jesus never tapped out. He never quit. Not even in Gethsemane. Any time that he could have, he could have done it easily. He had every right and legal option to get out. We didn't deserve it to start with. How about that? Jesus dying was not your right. Well, I didn't deserve it. I didn't do nothing to gain the favor of God. He fell in love with me when I was a mess. And in order for that to be redeemed, Jesus went to war for me. He didn't just go to us death. He went to war for me. Get this, guys. He is a warrior king. He's not away in a manger. No room for his head, for his beard, whatever. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. No. He ain't little Lord Jesus anymore. He's Lion of Judah. Come on. See, see, we just got to get some things in perspective here. Look at this. Let's read it again. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Let's just keep one thing straight. You're not my master because things went rough. 
You're still my adversary, and I am still a worthy uh, opponent. Come on, let's get this straight here. I am not now a victim. I am still your adversary because the Son of God is in me. And I, as long as I don't tap out, I am still a victorious opponent that will win. We are now more than conquerors. Jesus never anointed you to be a victim. He never anointed you to tap out. He never anointed you to be broken. He never anointed you to be a slave. He never anointed you to be an addict. He never anointed you to be sick. He called you more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Not in your own strength, in His. Because He's a champion king. He's bled for you when you wouldn't bleed for others. Come on, somebody. We need to get a fight back in us. No sickness has no authority. It only has authority when I start feeling sorry for myself and I start agreeing with the power of sickness instead of the goodness of God. Well, God's not done anything yet. Yeah, but Calvary's happened. I get that you got the bad news, but you need to let a few days pass by and a stone's going to roll away. Come on. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. I got some bad news, but I am not quitting. That is not my excuse to tap out of this season. It's not my excuse to give up the promises that God has given to me. Like the scripture I just quoted a little earlier. When the word of the Lord goes out, it doesn't go back to God. It's a messenger. It's a delivery boy when the word of God goes out. Delivery girl. Okay, whatever you need it to be. But it doesn't go back to God and report that it's been accomplished until it's been accomplished. Therefore, we wage war with prophecies. We don't negotiate with hell. We don't try and become relevant with hell. We don't try and become, you know, uh, 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 diluted to the world so we're not too hardcore. No, I'm really hardcore. I got the goodness of God. I got the Son of God. I have the Spirit of God in me. That makes me a military threat to hell. That's why I should not be surprised when various trials and testings and even persecution come to my life because I am a military threat to darkness. Come on. We're just going to get some perspective. Yeah, it's bumpy. I get it, man. Sometimes there's some bad news. There's some horrible things that happen to our personal lives, our family, our finances, our health, and even our nation right now. We don't quit. We don't roll over and just give up because, oh, well, everything just went to the devil. No, no, no. You have to understand, you guys read Hebrews 11 lately? Those that died in their faith. You know what that means? I might die, but I ain't quitting. (laughs) Come on, man. Do you understand that gets into the hall of fame in heaven? No, I want to have the kind of tenacity that even if it looks like I ain't going to inherit everything that God said, I'm not tapping. Come on. I'm going to let my life be a memorial to God. If, if I don't make everything that God told me, I'm still going to believe Him. I'm still going to be aggressive towards hell, and I'm still going to believe for everything that God told me I can have. How about that for the Hall of Fame in heaven? Now, I know that for some of you that this is probably very different preaching than you're used to in this Orange County territory. But if you'll come with me to heaven, you'll see that Jesus is a warrior king. And since when do warrior kings ever say, well, bless the Lord, brother? Can you imagine the devil? Can you? <laughs> Seriously, for a second. The battlefield's right there, and someone comes out from the, like, the U, little USC. There's smoke blowing, and there's lights coming through the smoke, and the devil's all hyped up in the ring, and someone just comes out like, praise the Lord. I'm aggressive. Now, aggressive for me might look different than aggressive for you, so you don't need to copy my aggressive. But what you do need to have is you do need to have a tenacity that will not sell your birthright. See, we want the story because Hollywood's come in and tried to tell us of the narrative of how God's supposed to treat our lives. So when things go wrong or things get uh, turbulent or when we get the opposite outcome of what was supposed to happen, oh, maybe God's forsaken me. Maybe I should go over and see what the devil's offering. No, no, we're not called to be weak. Even if it looks like things are going the opposite, that's 
actually the perfect environment for God. Because why would God get glory in something that's easy? Come on. Listen, the earth had to be without form and void, and darkness had to cover the deep in order for creation to look like a miracle. Come on, someone needs to get that. Lazarus, Jesus said, hey, they said to him, you could have come sooner and saved his life. And he's like, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't understand the narrative of the kingdom right now. Because in order for God to get the full glory, Lazarus actually had to pass away. <laughs> come on, somebody. Don't you rejoice over me, oh my enemy. You might have got some bad news. You might be trying to get inside my head and telling me that everything's going to fall apart. But I'm here to tell you, my God is a God that lets you think you won for a minute. And then out of nowhere, heaven breaks through and you can't stop this warrior king. Come on, somebody. I want you to be encouraged, guys. I want you to be encouraged. Jesus is moving in your life. He is the risen Son of God. Not the one hanging on a cross. He is the risen Son of God with healing in His wings. He is the risen Son of God above every other name. So it doesn't matter whether it's economic hardship, sickness, cancer. It doesn't matter what it is. Every other name must bow to the name of Jesus. So we just got to get back to this place of tenacity. Because here's the, here's the deal. In America, we say thank you to veterans, and that's awesome. I personally think that this nation should actually say thank you financially. Instead of sending money abroad to countries that have no love for this nation, how about we take care of those that have given all? That's just my opinion. I'm not a politician. But one of the ways that we can say thank you to Jesus is by actually cashing in the check that he wrote us at the cross and living like heaven is real, because it is. Living decided. See, a memorial typically is a monument built in honor of something. True? So how about our personal lives become memorials of the cross? How about my life becomes a memorial that when I get up, hell gets out of town? Because I just really feel like me living like I only half believe Jesus might as well not even be living for Jesus at all. That's why Jesus talked about in Revelation, he talked about the church, Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. You're a little bit of this and a little bit of that. How about you become fully decided? Jesus has decided on me and I want to be decided about him. And my life being decided about Jesus looks pretty lit up and aggressive. Not, not nasty, just aggressive. And I just encourage every single one of you, I don't, look, here's the deal. At some point, the world's going to say, well, Jesus, Christianity is toxic. That's all coming, by the way, just in case you haven't figured that out yet. That, that is coming. Christianity's toxic. Christianity is responsible. Oh, no. Oh, no. You already knew this was coming. Don't be shocked. God's just laying still. Oh, God's not defending us. Just lay still. He's laying still because he's getting ready to come. Okay? Oh, no, I got terrible news. Shh, shh. Heaven does not need your disagreement with its healing because that's the one thing that will kill healing is your disagreement, your doubt, your fear, your disbelief. So I just really want to land with that today. We're going to, we we want to honor the king. We want to honor the son by emulating his life. If Jesus came to be a role model, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, Jesus was really passive. He was really nice to people and stuff. Dude, Jesus made a whip and turn tables. Don't you tell me that Jesus don't have an aggressive side. Jesus has an aggressive, and he was mad with all the religious folks that were monetizing the gospel. That's not the Jesus that people want to talk about because that's awkward Jesus to them. But I want to talk about him because I don't want to have the Jesus of my making. I want to have the Jesus of who he is 
and I want to conform to his image. Come on, guys. So I don't care what the devil's told you. I don't care what he's going to tell you next week, next year, next decade. We win. Once you get decided on the idea that we win, you can see life differently. That's why, the, that's why Paul said, what can man do to me? You ain't got nothing that can move me. You didn't die for me. No president died for me. No general died for me. Not like that. You haven't assured my eternity. There's only one I answer to. There's only one I fear in the most respectful way possible. His name is Jesus. And so we honor him this weekend. And we're also grateful for every single person that served. Because it's, it's a type of a much greater person. So I hope you've got something today. I hope you've looked at this orange carpet one long last time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that this, this carpet and these pews are probably somewhere in the ballpark of 50 or 60 years old. It is not Jesus. <laughs> kind of like when I have one of those movies where they just throw the, throw the lighter in. <laughs> Let me just help you with an insurance claim. <laughs> But anyways, hey, look, we love you guys. I really pray you've been encouraged and that you've got something from today that we do not bow, we do not quit, we do not negotiate with hell, and we do trust the king that he is in control no matter what happens because he never has once lost a battle. Amen? Amen. Amen. Right, well, what we're going to do right now is if everyone wants to serve, Whitney, if you want to go find your place in the lobby, and if someone can go and actually put the slide back up on the screen of our address and all the details for next week so that everyone can be assured that they get it, because we will, if you come here, it's kind of going to be like that parable about the people that went to go get the oil, you know, and they came back and the door was locked because ain't no money going to be here. Might be another Jesus, a different Jesus. All right, so we're going to be at this new place next week. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we love you. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are a warrior king and that you saw us as worthy to fight for, worthy to liberate and worthy to bring into the house and family of God. So this weekend, we just take a minute to honor you, to thank you, and just to ask you, God, that you would infuse into us your warrior spirit, that we would have a no-tolerance policy against hell and darkness and every form of bad news, of bad environmental uh, um, condition, Father, that we would just be emissaries of heaven in Jesus' name, that we would live like our warrior king in Jesus' name. We love you, Father. Amen. Amen. We thank you for the season in the building, God, and we now thank you for the new season. Amen. So... We, you can kiss the carpet goodbye if you really need to, but we will be here never again. Uh, we will be back next week at the other campus at 1 p.m. on Sunday. We love you guys. If anyone needs prayer, we're going to be up the front for a minute. If you're new, please know that we would love to get to know you and just say hi. We don't want anyone feeling like they came in and had a cinema experience, so please just come and say hi to us. We'd really love to get to know you and just see how you're doing and see how we can serve you. Be blessed. Have a wonderful weekend. Remember, we're praying for daily for Janice and everyone else that needs healing in Jesus' name because we are going to fight to see the healing power of Jesus manifested in this church everywhere we go. Amen?